Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here. I met some of you yesterday during the session in the morning and later on when we went for a walk, some of the younger uh, students and, and people here this morning with us. It was a pleasure exchanging some views with, 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 uh, with, with some of you uh, on a topic which uh, in general is, I consider, very important, not just for politicians. Um, I am a political person. Uh, I was very active in politics. I am now retired, but uh, uh, still following actively what is happening around us. But this topic that uh, this symposium is addressing is something that should interest not just politicians, but of course politicians, um, lay people who, are, uh, uh, who want to see change, but inspired change, a change that is based on values, and not just a change that is based on popularity or populism, uh, but a change for the better in the society that we live in and in the world. And therefore, I believe that what, what, what this symposium is discussing throughout these uh, couple of days, three days, is actually very relevant to all the political, religious, and community leaders uh, who face this challenge of promoting peace in a world that uh, continues to, to witness conflicts on a daily basis. Yesterday's session gave us the opportunity, the privilege, not only to listen to President Zapatero, with whom I worked very closely during my nine years as Prime Minister of Malta around the European Union table. So I got to know President Zapatero quite well, but it was also interesting um, not only listening to his, to his analysis, but later on also to the ambassador of uh, Palestine uh, residing here in, in Madrid. Uh, because what was mentioned by uh, President Zabatero and, um, and the ambassador for Palestine yesterday was very Okuran. It, is, it related to what is happening now, now, this very day, at this very moment, um, uh, a few hundred miles away from Madrid in, uh, in, in, a, in a piece of land which is called Palestine and which, as I pointed out yesterday, is not limited to that area, but it is actually it, has, it is having impact on a global scale because what happens there influences um, the positions taken by the Arab world, even by the, 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 the large countries such as uh, the United States, uh, Russia, and a host of other nations who are concerned with what is happening in that area. As I said, this symposium deals with the potential role religion and politics play in the promotion of peace building. Uh, and uh, in our efforts to create stability. And we are invited, I have been invited actually, to discuss the challenges and opportunities uh, which world leaders who wish to contribute in one way or another to the promotion of world peace have to face. In reality, this nice talk, these nice words, we can say a lot of nice words about peace. Everybody, this is the easy part. You know, the easy part is to say very nice words about peace. Everybody really can say that. The challenge for us is, okay, what do you do when you are faced with, every, with a challenge on the spot? You have to make a decision. And that decision might mean that you will not be popular with your electorate. Uh, what do you do? What is your stand? Do you believe in the principles, in the values that you speak so nicely about? And will you translate those values into the real life difficult decisions which you have to take? So before I try to address this, you will notice that the title of my speech is actually um, focused on a particular, how shall I say, window, and that is the Libya conflict. But uh, please do not take the message I want to put this morning only as related to that window of eight, nine months, the Libya conflict in 2011. The point that I will try to make is that the lessons that, that we lived through are applicable uh, in a wider context. So I want to make two introductory remarks. First, as I said, I have chosen to address this topic by presenting you with some highlights. Not all. I can give you a lecture that goes on till tonight with respect to our experience um, as what Malta went through throughout the Libya crisis. But I will only choose one or two particular instances um, which tested, they tested whether we really believe in what we say, whether the values that we say we believe in, and we are an island um, which is an island of 400,000 people, very Catholic, we are Christians, very Roman Catholic, 
Okay. But with an open society where you can find the Islamic presence in Malta, the Protestant presence in Malta, the Baha'i presence in Malta, you know, uh, the, Jew, the, the Jewish presence in Malta. So it's an open society. We have no problem. But we are 80% Roman Catholic. So it's a very Catholic society. But an island of 400,000, smack in the middle of the Mediterranean. So we are between Sicily and Tripoli. To e equal distance, I will, in, a, in a minute I will show you a map uh, of the Mediterranean Sea where you will uh, understand what I'm talking about. So um, I have decided to, to pick two or three instances from the Libya experiences because I honestly believe that sharing this experience with you provides us all with an opportunity to review uh, a real life, not theory. This is, I'm not going to talk about theory. I'm going to talk about what we went through in some particular instances. Not because we have anything special, not because we are here to, to show everybody uh, you know, um, how big we are, 400,000 people. Um, I always argue with my friends that uh, had we given an extra 10% in the population, we would have been an empire. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, that is just um, uh, a wishful thinking from an island state that remains small in territory and in people, but which is proud of its heritage. So it's a tr real true-to-life scenario, one which placed the Maltese society in front of some very tough decisions, which had to be taken notwithstanding that those decisions meant some serious political and economic risks, but which eventually uh, proved to be morally and ethically correct because they place the value and the dignity of the human person above anything else. And I think this is the important point I would like to put to you um, throughout my speech. I am going to talk about the human dignity of the human person, whoever that person is. And it is that single issue that should guide leaders, political, religious, uh, community leaders, that one single issue that should guide us in, the, in taking one decision instead of another. So in doing so, I hope to make the point that a humanitarian response to conflict is a responsibility which must be shouldered notwithstanding the political and economic risks that may be involved. This point was made yesterday by some of the speakers. I intend to emphasize it once more. You can respond to conflict by sending planes. You can respond to conflict by sending soldiers. I argue that everybody should respond as, as a responsibility to a conflict by addressing the humanitarian crisis that every conflict arises. And if we are scared to do so, then, then shirking that responsibility will mean that the consequences will be very, very serious. I will mention Syria as an example of what happens when the international community decides to stand back and not intervene on a humanitarian basis because the consequences today are there for everybody to see. The second point I would like to make in my first, this first part of my, my talk to you this morning is that in describing Malta's humanitarian response during the Libya conflict, I also intend to put forward for your consideration the, the side effect of conflict, uh, because conflict has a lot of side effects. Uh, it is not the soldiers shooting each other or the revolutionaries shooting each other or bombing or whatever, but there is a side effect um, of the conflict, which is extremely, extremely tragic. Um, I intend to put, to link conflict in the team with irregular migration. Uh, in other words, the refugees, the victims, the innocent victims of conflict, the ones who are not don't have any guns, they are the ones who are very often the weakest in society, children, uh, you know, um, old people, pregnant women, women with child, very often the victims of conflict. Um, they have nothing that protects them, they have no protection against the bullets, but they are often the weakest part. So, Irregular migration, which is a direct uh, result of conflict, very often linked to poverty, 
Very often, recently, as we are finding out, look at what, ha what is happening in Iraq. Uh, also now, the issue of religious persecution in Nigeria, um, in certain parts of Africa, the concept of religious persecution and the concept of um, internal religion of, uh, co uh, conflict, the Sunni and the Shiites, the different sectarian approaches. Uh, so they are victims of all of this, victims of violence, victims of injustice. And I will link conflict with this dimension because it puts us to the test, all of us. Uh, the Mediterranean countries, those who always speak nice words about uh, democracy and peace, I am a very staunch democratic supporter. Uh, but then when I am put to the test, the issue is, what do I do if I get to know that there is this uh, injustice that is being uh, suffered by millions of refugees who are escaping from conflict? I repeat, this is not textbook. This is not theory. If you switch on the news on your televisions, if you go online now, now, you will find out that thousands of people are crossing the Mediterranean on dinghies, rubber dinghies, and a lot of them are drowning in the middle of the sea, and nobody gives any notice. Nobody wants to address this issue. So I suggest to you that the promotion of world peace, as beautiful as it sounds, demands that we first address this issue, in other words, the treatment of fellow human beings like us, who, who smile, who cry, who suffer, like every one of us, and to, to check whether we are dealing with this issue seriously or whether we feel uncomfortable. Um, because, you know, a politician who wants to go back home and wants to get elected in the next election will probably say, say that if I speak about immigration and refugees in my country, in my town, in my city, nobody will vote for me. Because nobody wants to listen. Nobody wants to understand that there is a tragedy there. Everybody wants to defend his or her own area. For this reason and for the purposes of my talk to you, it is important for you to understand that I interpret the word peace in a wider humanitarian context, one which is inspired by values that I hope, I believe, are common to all religions and which challenge us to take a stand in favor of human rights and human dignity above everything else. History teaches us that there can never, never be peace and stability without genuine and sincere respect for the human dignity of every human person. Even if that person happens to be destitute, dark-skinned or light-skinned, and packed into a rubber dinghy in the middle of an unforgiving sea, desperate to reach the shores of another continent in the hope of finding a new life for him or her and for their family. Okay, I'll come now to the part of my speech where I will speak about the Libya conflict. I repeat, this is an, a, a window that took place over nine months in 2011, starting in, in the la later part of 2010 with the uprising that took place in Tunisia. The Libya conflict, in fact, represents an, in, in, an important chapter in the political life of my country um, and the Mediterranean region and provides us with the context of the talk. It is not a story that has ended. It is still ongoing now. So Libya is still in a problem. Uh, there are complications in Libyan territories still to this very day. So to be precise, I should refer to the event as not the Libyan conflict as a conflict, which seems to imply uh, something that has a beginning and an end, but it was an uprising because it represents a moment in time when the Libyan people decided to revolt uh, against uh, the dictator Gaddafi and his regime, a regime that had ruled Libya for more than 40 years and uh, with whom Malta had a lot of dealings because Libya is our, one of our closest neighbors. It was an uprising that eventually led to a conflict which lasted um, throughout 2011 and which un unfortunately left some scars in Libyan society which will take a very long time to heal. First, 
some background facts. The December 2010, um, the so-called Arab Spring, was ignited, if you recall, by a young Tunisian street hawker named Mohammed Bouazizi, uh, who, because the police of Ben Ali, the dictator Ben Ali in Tunisia, the police had decided he was selling some vegetables, and that was his only income. And he was selling some vegetables on a, on a, on a street hawking in the streets in, 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 in Tunis. And, uh, um, and uh, he, had, he did not have the license to do so. So the police went and confiscated his cart, which, which was his only source of living. And this young man, um, who was, I believe, 23 years old at the time, um, decided to protest against Ben Ali's hardline dictatorship by paying the ultimate price, his life, his young life, as a sign of popular discontent against the autocratic regime. And he burned himself. I will not go into the details, uh, but you must know that what happened after that with the... Uh, with the um, how shall I say, with the aid of technology. Uh, this is when we, the world found out that this, this uh, little machine here, which is as big as a biscuit, uh, can create a revolution. You know, um, and in Tunisia, and then later in Egypt, and also in Libya, it was the Facebook, it was the social media that circulated messages that um, created the uprising in the North African continent bringing down three dictators, this little biscuit of a, of a little machine here. This is what we are able to create. You know, human, humankind is, is such an intelligent, such a, such, such a wonderful piece of creation. And this is what intelligence, if used well, is able to, to, to create. So anyway, within a few weeks, um, the uprising in Tunisia spread along the North African coast into Egypt with the fall of Mubarak, and soon after that, into Libya. Okay, so I spoke about Malta, and now let's see if this thing works. Uh, now, okay, there. Uh, that is just a, 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 a one slide that shows you where Malta is. The top part is Sicily, and then there's Malta right there, the circle, red circle in the center. Tripoli is further down. So you can see we are very close to Sicily, but very close to Tripoli and very close to Tunis. That is the shortest route, straight line, by uh, immigrants wanting to escape from North Africa, all over North Africa, Somalia, Ethiopia, Syria, uh, eventually when there was Iraq. Uh, a lot of uh, refugees wanting to escape from the violence and terror used that route, traveling to Tripoli. Tripoli is the um, uh, circle in red, the second circle in red, and then crossing the Mediterranean Sea using rubber dinghies, um, uh, going straight up to Sicily, but very often ending up on the shores of Malta, not because they really wanted to come to Malta, uh, but their target was Europe and, and moving up through, through Italy into the heart of Europe. So you will understand Malta's close proximity to the location where these historic events were taking place mean that we had to make some very dramatic choices which would transform the island's role from that of a spectator to one where we would choose to actively participate in a major humanitarian effort to save thousands of lives of innocent civilians who were escaping from the horror, horrors that were taking place at the time. Of course, the, ex the concerns expressed by the international community during the first days of the uprising were shared by us Maltese and perhaps understood even more deeply, precisely because of, of the proximity, we were, how close we were uh, to the Libyan conflict, which was growing by the hour. Okay, I will now speak, uh, spend some, uh, just, just a few sentences on the, the, one of the challenges. We had a series of challenges, but I've chosen one particular, the moral and ethical challenge which we faced. Malta's moral and ethical challenges brought about by the Libya conflict were born in this context and with this background. We are a neutral state. We have a constitution which says that Malta is neutral. 
Um, and we have one of the most open economies in the world. A large chunk of our economy uh, depends on the services sector. We are a well-known financial services sector on the island. But a good part of the services sector is also tourism. Um, you will understand immediately what a conflict means when your economy depends on tourism. You get all the tourists scared and everybody wants to avoid your country. So we were faced immediately with the prospect of having one of our most important economic pillars employing thousands of Maltese and non-Maltese on the island, suddenly being in danger of collapsing because of the Libya conflict. And therefore, the, the, the temptation to, to, remain, to remain neutral, not to touch this thing, because it could, it could kill our economy. Um, the, the nature of our economy being an open economy, therefore, demanded policies which encouraged uh, strong relations with all our neighbors, stability, and uh, open commercial exchanges with the markets with whom we did business, as well as a society that was open to a multicultural and multi-religious reality. It was precisely for these reasons that the Libya conflict brought us face to face with some tough questions that needed tough answers. I'll mention some. Should we seek peace by remaining neutral in the best interest of our economy? Does neutrality mean you are neutral even when human rights are being breached? Does true neutrality imply that, like Pilate, we wash our hands of our responsibilities? Should we choose to defend our peaceful coexistence with our neighbor, Libya, by turning a blind eye to the atrocities that were taking place uh, on our doorstep, right next to us? Should we choose to stand aside and plead neutrality as a convenient excuse to condone what is morally wrong? Or did we have the moral courage to take a principled stand from the very start of the conflict and speak out in an effort to influence the regime to stop the atrocities the destruction of property, the killing of innocent civilians. Okay, so on Monday, 17th February of 2011, the uprising in Libya started. 17th November, uh, sorry, 17th February, 2011. On Monday, 21st February, so just four days after the uprising in Benghazi, because it started in Benghazi, four days after, um, I was holding my, as Prime Minister, my weekly um, cabinet meeting. It's a meeting of all ministers, which used to take place at least once a week on a Monday. And uh, on that day, this is four days after the uprising, we had noticed what was going on. We were very worried about how this will impact our economy, our jobs. We had hundreds of Maltese also who had investments in Libya, major investments, or who were working in Libya. So we were very worried. But by the time we had been informed that the forces of the regime, of the Gaddafi regime, um, had reacted in strength and in full force uh, to counteract the popular protests taking place in, in the east of Libya. In Benghazi alone, in the first 24 hours, 35 people were killed, hundreds injured. Within a couple of days, 300 unarmed civilians were killed and many more injured by the regime security forces, by the police and their army. On that day, during that cabinet meeting, we made our first choice. We decided that we could not remain uh, neutral, in the sense our neutrality, our constitutional neutrality was there and will remain there. But we decided to speak out and to condemn what was happening around us. Uh, and I made my first public statement in front of the local and international media, condemning the violence and making it clear that the Libyan people's aspirations against the regime should be respected. It was a difficult choice for us. Our commercial interests were, of course, um, vital for us. The interests of many hundreds of Maltese workers, as I said, the interests of Maltese investment and the interests of good neighborly relations with Gaddafi and with Libya were obviously important, but this notwithstanding, we decided 
that we were not going to just pretend that nothing was happening. And that we wanted to stand by, next to the Libyan people, from a humanitarian and human rights point of, point of view. So we decided we are not going to remain silent and whatever the cost, even the economic cost, we were prepared to condemn it in the most uh, clear terms possible, including making a clear statement that uh, if the Gaddafi regime was going to continue with the atrocities, then Gaddafi and his regime should be removed. We were prepared to mediate and help both sides. We were prepared to speak to the Gaddafi regime because we were in good contact with them. But mediation did not mean pretending that the atrocities were not taking place or allowing the atrocities to, be, uh, to continue. Mediation meant that we would do our best to stop the violence and to, to insist that there would be respect for fundamental human rights. That was our first choice. Within four hours from that first choice, we were faced with another difficult choice, followed by the consequences. Um, again, it was related to the value, to the principle of respect for human rights and the dignity of the human person. So three hours after finishing speaking to the media, and to the media, this was, this was, remember, on the 21st of February 2011, four days after the uprising started. The UN Security Council had not yet met, but they, it was on the agenda. There were two resolutions issued by the Security Council. One of them was a condemnation of the regime and uh, insisting that the regime should, should stop, and which imposed a ban of sale of armaments to Libya. And then later, a second resolution which imposed the no-fly zone. But on the fourth day after the uprising, there was no Security Council, there was no cover, there was no UN um, official position on this issue, although it was planned. But on that day, 21st of February, four hours after my cabinet meeting, um, I got a telephone call informing me as Prime Minister that two Mirage jets armed to their feet with live ammunition, had just landed in Malta seeking and asking for asylum. Uh, the two Mirage jets were obviously piloted by two Libyan Air Force pilots who had landed in Malta um, practically without, um, of course, without requesting permission. They had landed into, into our hangar. Yeah, okay. Those are the two Mirage jets um, that landed up in our... Now, mind you, we have one international airport. One. No, just one airport, international and national. So imagine we had uh, Air Malta, Alitalia, Lufthansa, Ryanair, EasyJet, British Airways, Air France, landing with tourists coming to Malta who suddenly saw two Mirage jets parked in our runway, uh, you know, with police surrounding them, etc. Okay, well, both pilots requested political asylum, stating that they had... Now, now this, is the, this is what they told us immediately. They told us that they had refused to obey a specific order by the regime, um, ordering the pilots to shoot and kill civilians living in a, in a small village just outside of Benghazi. The, the, the pilots and the squadron of Mirage jets had been ordered to carry out uh, this, this mission. They refused, and although there were two Mirage jets, part of a, of a fleet of seven, um, as soon as they left Tripoli uh, Mitiga airport, the two of them just changed course, went down to sea level, and escaped the radar of both Tripoli and Malta, and suddenly appeared uh, next to the island. The short distance which you saw on the map meant that within a few seconds for, um, for a jet plane, within a few seconds, literally, or perhaps a minute or two, the jets would have traveled and crossed the Mediterranean and appeared on the, Mediterranean, on the island of Malta without prior notice whatsoever. So they told us that they decided to defect and they asked us uh, for, for, for asylum, choosing Malta 
as the closest and possibly the safest location, of course, from their point of view. Of course, the landing of the two Mirage jets in Malta was of major significance, both regionally and internationally, because it was the first, um, the first setback, major setback for Gaddafi. This was the first defection, major defection of Gaddafi, from, um, for, for Gaddafi. So Libya was horrified. Gaddafi was angry, uh, and he was prepared, his regime was prepared to do anything to stop this, because this would encourage the rest of the revolution. You know, the revolutionaries would be uh, so happy that two pilots of the official Libyan regime defected and went over to their side. So it was a major event for the regime, a major event for the international community. And, uh, uh, and it was picked up immediately. Within a few minutes of the landing, 21st of February 2011, we were on international news all over the world. CNN, Sky News, BBC, all over. Now, I don't know whether this will work, but there is supposed to be a short video link to this, uh, but I'm not sure whether the whole thing will work. If not... Yeah, do you mind? Uh, you just, yeah, the right one, I think. Okay, there it is. Um, now, this is a video that should be sound, but... Uh, um, this was uh, shown, this is a video taken from the uh, Euronews, Euronews uh, main channel like this. You had CNN transmitting, the, these are live, whoops, live, live shots. Okay, 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 We've, you've moved on to the next slide now, but that's okay, that's all right. But that, it's okay, it, otherwise we'll, we'll that, 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 just, just leave it, no, no, we're, we're okay, leave it on that slide now. Um, that short video with, with the sound actually indicated that we were, we were on the news all over the place. So Malta was now the focus of international media attention and news reports appeared on every international uh, channel. Of course, as I said, the event had historical significance, major significance. Um, and uh, within minutes of that happening, we received messages from Gaddafi himself uh, who was insisting with his officials, with us, we want the planes back. They were asking for the pilots as well. We want the pilots back and we want the planes back. Okay, this was a big test uh, for us. Um, to a certain extent, granting asylum to the, to the pilots was a straightforward decision. Uh, of course, we immediately gave them asylum. We immediately gave them uh, protection and we immediately told the Libyan government that were not prepared to return the pilots, but we were in difficulty with respect to the planes themselves, uh, because the demand for the return of the two Mirage jets was a different matter. Our lawyers, our international lawyers were telling us that uh, legally, at that point, there was still, I repeat, no UN resolution, but that was legal uh, Libyan property, legitimate Libyan property and that technically we had no grounds, no legal grounds to refuse to return the Mirage jets. I recall very clearly the tense discussions we held internally in those dramatic moments, um, fully realizing that on the one hand, a decision to keep the Mirage jets meant that we risked facing Gaddafi's vicious retaliation, whilst a decision to return them risked being interpreted as an act of betrayal by the Maltese government a betrayal of the Libyan people and the Arab Spring movement itself. By midnight of that same day, we had made up our minds. We would not betray the Libyan people. We would not deliver to Gaddafi, or give him back, instruments of death, which were already being used to murder innocent civilians who were guilty of nothing except that of freely expressing their wish to have a better life, a better future for themselves and their children. And in fact, the jets, the Mirage jets, were not returned. They remained blocked on the main runway of our international airport for uh, the rest of the conflict. The Libyan regime's reaction uh, did not take long to manifest itself. The first thing they did was to threaten us that an Air Malta plane, because we had regular daily flights to Tripoli um, with our national airline. So the first threat we got was that the Air Malta planes sitting on Tripoli runway 
would themselves be impounded by the Libyan regime and not return to Malta, and that passengers and crew would be arrested. Later, the following day, um, the regime continued to push, put pressure on us, and uh, we were informed by our military uh, services that there was a secret mission uh, being taken place with a private plane um, coming over to Malta, asking for emergency landing, carrying uh, about eight people whom we found out were actually uh, pilots, engineers, uh, two pilots, two engineers, and uh, some military officials. It was obvious that they were trying to land with an excuse to try and take the planes over uh, using a secret miss mission uh, late at night. But uh, uh, our early discovery, we got to know about this through our contacts, allowed us to take preventive action. We did not allow that private plane to land in Malta, and therefore that uh, mission by Libya was by the Libyan regime um, was, was uh, avoided, was disrupted. There is, there is much more to the story. It is a very interesting story, <laughs> but I will not go into details because time is short and, uh, and I, I do not want to take too much of your time. The, the point I am making is this. Uh, um, the die was cast. We had taken a position. With one stroke, we cancelled in Malta a political relationship that had lasted for more than 40 years. Uh, we condemned the brutality that was taking place, and we were one of the first countries in the world that declared that it was time for Gaddafi and his regime to go. Uh, it was time for them to go. Of course, you will understand from what I remarked earlier that the economic implications for us were of major concern. The international media was projecting images of the two Mirage jets sitting on the tarmac of our international airport. Our national carrier, as well as carriers from other countries, uh, were flying into Malta with regular, uh, um, uh, on a regular basis, bringing tourists whose first impression of the island was that of a country very close to a conflict zone and involved in the conflict. The scenario became even more complicated when some weeks later, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 1973 and imposed what later became known as a no-fly zone over Libyan territory, which meant that hundreds of military planes were flying through Maltese airspace on a daily basis throughout the whole week. One must add to all this the fact that Malta's close proximity to Libya made it the preferred transit location for thousands of non-Libyan citizens who were escaping from Libya because of the conflict. Ships like the one you see in the slide they're full of scared civilians of all nationalities. Thousands started to enter the Maltese harbor in Valletta, including some severely injured indiv individuals requiring urge urgent medical attention. The images projected by the international media was of Malta inundated by a deluge of very scared human beings escaping from a conflict zone and wanting to return to their countries of origin via Malta. Once again, these were the challenges facing Malta and, uh, and uh, its citizens. We could have easily avoided all of this by turning a blind eye um, and not taking notice of the human tragedy that was taking place a short distance from our shores. We could have defended ourselves by pleading neutrality, by arguing that Malta did not have the resources to deal with this tragedy, or by stating that larger states should shoulder this responsibility. You will note these are the same arguments that are being used today by some countries to avoid dealing and shouldering the responsibility in front of immigration, the immigration challenge. Same arguments. Instead, we again chose to place our humanitarian responsibilities above everything else, including our immediate economic interests. Today, with the benefit of hindsight, I am proud of the fact that the grave economic risks caused by our stance did not stop us from taking a principled decision that uh, we had taken as from the first day when we decided nothing would stop us from exercising our role as a, uh, as a modern country that had full respect for human rights and carried out its humanitarian duties even in the face of some very risky scenarios. So Malta's humanitarian role during the crisis grew exponentially as days passed by. And as I have already stated, the events in Libya unfolded at an alarming rate and as a result, most countries were taken unawares by the sudden escalation of violence and the consequent risks to their citizens. 
there are more slides uh, in my presentation, but I will, I mean, if, if, if somebody has the, the control, you can put on the next couple of slides, um, which will show that thousands of expatriates, technicians, oil experts, engineers, electricians, doctors, business people, and many others found themselves uh, caught up in the midst of the turmoil. A large number of these workers were caught in the middle of the Libyan desert towards the east part of Libya, taking, making it extremely difficult for them to identify a safe means of transport that could remove them from the danger zones and return them to their home country. As a result, during the first couple of weeks, we were inundated by requests from different governments all over the world, including China, Russia, India, Brazil, because their citizens were caught up in the middle of this and they needed help quickly to repatriate uh, and safely their citizens back to their country. Uh, a large number of these were caught in the middle of the Libyan desert. Uh, so uh, we, we offered Malta's full assistance. And suddenly in Malta, we had military planes landing in our airport now, but only uh, transport planes uh, to repatriate uh, citizens that were traveling in all forms of means of travel, crossing from Libya to Malta to try and go back to their country. I will not take more of your time by going into the details of the enormous effort and extremely well-coordinated actions carried out by hundreds of health professionals, paramedics, civil protection officers, social workers, uh, police, uh, and civilians who voluntarily offered their services to help those thousands of citizens escaping from Libya, as well as hundreds of injured Libyan citizens who were uh, flown into Malta throughout the conflict and who received free, free medical care in our hospital. So I'll uh, spend a couple of minutes on the lessons learned. The Gaddafi regime came to an end with the fall of Tripoli on the 24th of August 2011. So it started on the 17th of February 2011. Tripoli fell in, in August 2011. Two months after the fall of Tripoli, and that is on the 20th of October 2011, Gaddafi himself came to a brutal and violent end, which unfortunately added to the atrocities carried out during the conflict. I disagree completely with the way Gaddafi uh, found the end of his life. That is not right. And whatever side you take, again, that should be condemned. Two and a half years have passed since then. You know, time flies. So those dramatic events took place quite some time ago. And so far, until today, there is no real sign of the peace and stability which we all hoped to see flourishing in this region, which seems destined to remain in constant turmoil. Admittedly, more time needs to pass before a political transition to a new system of government is accepted by those who are involved. President Zapatero yesterday highlighted this when he was talking about Tunisia on one side, but then he was referring also to other parts of the North African continent and saying that it will take years for a transition to take place and to be culturally embraced, culturally embraced by a society that is not really used to um, this style of government. Wounds still need to heal and institutions, democratic institutions, will need to be built and strengthened in order to allow for constructive political dialogue to take place. Sadly, the outlook for the future continues to be very challenging, not only in Libya, but also in the whole region. Recent events in this part of the world have indicated that religion and sectarian issues have resurfaced strongly um, and are now being put forward as the main reason for more conflict, more atrocities, more civil, political and social unrest. The events in Syria and in Iraq speak for themselves, especially with respect to Iraq, where the recent push of ISIS has now been accompanied by claims of the partitioning of Iraq's uh, national territory based on sectarian and religious criteria. They are, there is now talk about ir dividing Iraq into Shia and Sunni areas. So now even sectarian religion is being used as the, as the criteria to divide Iraq into different territories. So the situation is getting worse, it is not getting better. And in the meantime, the world looks on. 
the international community seems to continue to appear impotent in the face of these horrors and loss of life that is taking place. In Syria, thousands have died and many more innocent civilians have been injured or left homeless and destitute, having fled from their country trying to seek refuge in some other country. I checked the UNHCR website before I came to Madrid and this website indicates that until the 8th of July, a few days ago, there was a total of 2.9 million registered Syrian refugees, registered Syrian refugees, 18% of whom are children under the age of four years. In the Middle East, the killing continues from both sides. I was starting to be hopeful yesterday morning when I listened to the BBC news and there seemed to be an initiative by Egypt to get both sides, uh, Israel and Palestine, to find a solution for them to stop uh, the, 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 uh, the, the uprising that is taking place now, uh, but so far there has been no positive outcome. This is the Middle East, this is Syria, this is Iraq, but in several parts of Africa, um, sectarian and religious extremism has taken root and children, young girls, uh, have been kidnapped, again with religion as the background. Uh, vulnerable men and women are being kidnapped, raped and slaughtered in the name of a religion that supposedly preaches peace, but in reality practices war in the worst form. In my opinion, our collective failure, and I will not beat about the bush, it is a failure. There's no two ways about it. Our collective failure to sufficiently underscore, push, mention, emphasize, the humanitarian dimension of these conflicts has made matters much worse. In Syria, instead of containment, we now have conflict expanding and spreading at an alarming rate all over the region. All this brings me to draw three conclusions, and I will, this brings me to the end of my talk. But I want to make three points, three conclusions, which I would like to share with you, possibly for further debate during the symposium later on by other speakers and by those who want to participate. First consideration, from what I have mentioned, and I, I repeat, I could have mentioned uh, a long list of other personal experiences, real life, not theory, not textbook, uh, real life uh, incidents that took place over the past months. Uh, but the lesson we draw every single time is inaction, where we don't do anything, inaction, when we are faced with conflict, is always the worst option. The international community cannot and should not choose the easy way out of a difficult situation. Pretending that the conflict will go away, pretending that the conflict is only a matter of national, uh, purely national interest, so everybody keeps, keeps far away from even speaking out, uh, then that time has shown is a big mistake. Likewise, arguing that the conflict is a matter of a country's internal national interest only is a very short-sighted way of dealing with a crisis that ends up on our doorstep. Now, mind you, please don't misunderstand me. I am not talking about intervening on the ground in some military way. Um, this is not what I'm talking about. What I am talking is intervening on the humanitarian and human rights and fundamental uh, rights of the individual. And that is a responsibility of the whole community. And it is a mistake for the international community not to do so. Again, I repeat, it is so easy to make nice speeches, but when you come to the test, those nice words need to be translated in real terms on the ground in the country where the conflict is taking place. The reality is that in today's world, technology has made it a lot easier for a conflict to overspill into adjacent territories, and therefore we have a direct impact on the course of events of neighboring countries whether they like it or not. Syria is the latest example of this, but it's, it is not just Syria. The second um, consideration. The civilized world cannot continue to remain in denial when confronted by the very real challenge caused by the escalating numbers of refugees and irregular migrants who are all innocent victims of all sorts of tragedies. It seems to me that we are failing to grasp the fact that conflict generates forced migration, which is illegal, irregular, call it what you want, but it is forced migration. These people don't really want to migrate, but they have been forced to migrate. 
because their life is in danger. The life of their children is in danger. Would any one of us in the Western world stop from doing anything to save our children? Don't these people have the right to defend their, their, their families and to try and find a safe way uh, out of conflict? So conflict generates forced migration, which in turn generates unrest and eventually becomes itself source for further conflict. This is a vicious circle which appears to be escalating as time goes by. And mind you, this is not just about the Middle East, it is not just about Africa. If you look at Australia, they are faced with an immigration problem over there. And recently there have been news items showing that Australia's pushback policy uh, is in very serious doubt as to whether it is the correct way, the humanitarian way of dealing with the tragedy of uh, uh, individual persons. And it's not just Australia, mind you, that faces the problem of immigration. North America, with, with, with citizens crossing over from the Mexican border into North America, even there you have a major uh, issue of migration. The Caribbean, with people traveling in the Caribbean islands, even there you have an immigration problem. And of course, uh, Africa. So don't we think that this is an, a global problem? Isn't it a growing global problem? And will not climate change and the lack of water and the lack of resources continue to push this? And yet, notwithstanding that it is perhaps one of the largest, biggest challenges of humankind in recent history, and yet the world looks on and we pretend that it is not a problem and we don't even mention it because if we do, we are no longer popular with our electorate. We are afraid of losing our votes. So we need to do more than what has been done so far. Perhaps we need to rediscover the true meaning of the word solidarity. In a recent article written by a sociologist, which I have only discovered uh, in recent days, he's a Polish sociologist named Sigmund Bauman. Uh, and he wrote a very interesting article. He has a number of books uh, which you would want to look up, Sigmund Bauman. But in, in a recent article, he, ar he argues that um, he, he makes the statement, to practice solidarity means to have one's thinking and actions on the principle of one for all and all for one. One for all and all for one. I take the liberty of arguing in, uh, in here and urging this symposium to examine whether the world is thinking and acting with regards to the immigration challenge um, on the principle of one for all and all for one? Or are we making exceptions and saying, yes, one for all, but as long as that one is our own citizen and not somebody else, or of our, the, our own religion, or of our own culture, or of our own colored skin? We are not living a one for all and all for one. And this is not solidarity. This is hypocrisy. This is not real solidarity. It is the contradiction of solidarity. And finally, the third point, and I will conclude with this, but it is also a very important point. To be successful, our political discourse, and the symposium speaks about interreligious dialogue and, and political discourse, our political discourse um, must undergo, in my opinion, a radical change from what it has become in recent times. Unfortunately, the global financial and economic crisis has, in my opinion, brought with it an additional crisis which has escaped the attention of most of us. It is a moral and ethical crisis which seems to have silenced those politicians who advocate politics inspired by values that are part of our heritage, in my case, an important part of my Christian heritage. There is a reason why a lot of politicians have shut up. They do not speak. Um, they are politicians who value, who have Christian values, uh, but they are silenced. Their sound is not there. They are absent. I think there is a reason for this, because most economies are today still trying to deal with the consequences of the collapse of the global economy as a result of the financial crisis. In some countries, Spain, Italy, France, well, practically in most of Europe, unemployment has reached uh, historical levels. Young people 
graduates from university after spending five, six, seven of their best years in university graduate and then are unable to find work. Um, so economic growth in most countries is sluggish. Um, social inequality is growing. People earning a lot of money are earning more, but people, er people earning uh, less money are earning less. So the, the, the divide in the income groups, the income inequality is growing at a, an alarming rate. As a result, populist policies have found fertile ground in those democracies where people are overcome by the enormous effort to deal with the challenges of everyday life at home, at work, in our towns, and in our cities. This explains the violent political discourse which became so evident during the recent European Parliament elections. Have a look at the European Parliament. Now, this is the Western world. This is the democratic world. This is the world we believe in, we have worked in, we, 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 we present as a model. But in recent weeks, a few weeks ago, the result of the European Parliament elections was that the far-right parties suddenly gained ground. Since the Second World War, we've never seen anything like this. And why? Well, that's the populist. That is what is the trend today. And my challenge to everyone today is, do we have the courage, the moral courage, to stand up to this and speak out, not in the populist fashion, but in the principles and values that we really believe in? This is trend in political discourse needs to be reversed from one which is populist into one which is value-based. And we need to rediscover the beauty of politics when it is based on values and principles. And we need to remove the ugly politics that is based on populist uh, criteria. So therefore, I conclude by urging the Interparliamentary Alliance for Human Rights and Global Peace to continue with its efforts in this direction and to be proactive in every forum in promoting these values, which are the priceless inheritance that our forefathers left us to treasure and to promote.